welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board gaming. With me, as always, is the best man with me in this room right now, Michael Walker. How you doing, Walker? Fantastic, Mark. And I am your co-host, Mark Bigney. We have a little bit of an update from last week. We had the best kind of pedantry, namely an update to an open question, and that is the subject of Nine Tiles by Oink Games. Turns out it's been licensed several times already, including to Podboy favorite, Pokemon. Very nice. There have been many versions of Nine Tiles. They're kind of churning it out. It's not quite their code names yet, but who knows? Give it time and it might be. Uh, because I'd expressed amazement that they were licensing out Nine Tiles to Chainsaw Man, because it seemed like a strange venue, but they've been licensing out like crazy. So, sure, why not Chainsaw Man? Why not? So that is an update from last week. This is a board gaming podcast about board games. We are first going to talk about the Eurus, the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. The as yet unnamed retrospective intro segment. We are then going to talk about the games we played last week. And then we're going to talk about our topic. Our topic this week is completionism. Walker, what did we review last year? Well, Mark, we it was a controversial game. I won't say controversial, but it's odd. I was wondering if we should skip it because it's not a game that you would replay. But we can still talk about what we felt about it back then. It is called Vienna Connection, and it is a sort of like a one-off game that you would play once, and you really would not return to it. Sort of like an exit game. Well, or... you play the campaign once. Yes. There, there were five separate true, sessions. True, true, yeah. You, you would play the game multiple times. Right. But after you had completed the game, you would not return to it. Correct. And I do think, for what it's worth, in the context of campaign-style games, we are very much more in the mood for uh, circumscribed duration, not the open, sprawling thing. Although, uh, I don't know, there might be mounting enthusiasm for trying Frosthaven someday. But yes, uh, committing to five specific scenario-based games was a much, much easier lift. And when this opportunity came to us from Portal Games, this was a review copy sent to us by the publisher. We were, we were somewhat interested in giving it a try. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was not the kind of thing that I would ever go out and seek for myself necessarily. But I played it with Dr. Contra, and we enjoyed it a great deal. I quite liked the story. I quite liked the setting, the historical backdrop of sort of Cold War espionage stuff. There was only a couple times where the inferential leaps struck me as very, very odd, which is something that I encounter all the time in a lot of other mystery-based games. Yeah, it was. I hadn't played that type of game before. It was a nice distraction during the COVID times. And I played it solo, and I enjoyed it. Nice puzzles to figure out. Interesting things that, you know, there's different paths to go that got you the same information, but different ways. Like I said, you went one way to get information and my way was Morse code and right. lots of things like that. Were very yeah, there were little sub puzzles and sub mini games that we, that we did very, very differently. And so comparing notes was very interesting. And if that's the kind of experience you're looking for, honestly, I highly recommend Vienna Connections. It, it, it gives a sort of narrative context and historical backdrop that games like the Escape Rooms or the, or the Unlock games are really lacking to my taste. And so it felt rather more that I was participating in some kind of narrative rather than solving these kinds of puzzles. And as a consequence, that really brought me in. And it's completely resettable. It's not one of these one-off destroy cards or anything. Right. Thing is, you get to put it back the way it was, and then another person can enjoy it. Well, yes, you you might look at it and see, oh, I only get to play it five times. But of course, the tragedy of our hobby, certainly for high volume users, is how many games in your collection have you played more than five times to begin with? And number two, it is very easy to pass it off after you've actually done that. So again, uh, you might want to look on the second hand market. There might be a fair or, number of or copies. That we have another copy here. So if you're up for a game, ask for Vienna Connection, and it'll be on its way to you. So that was Vienna Connection, reviewed last year from Portal Games, designed by Jacob Pajeki, Prisloma Reimer, Ignacy Cherwicek, and Jacob Lapot. Now, on to the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, I finally got to play a review copy of Mindbug that was sent to us, Mindbug Beyond. This is a quick card game designed by Richard Garfield, Staff Ellis, Marvin Hengen, and Christian Kuhel. This is put out by Nerd Lab Games, and it's sort of like a single deck. You have a single deck of cards. You deal each player 10 cards and then three each to track life. And you have these two mind bug cards, hence the name mind bug. And on your turn, you just get to do certain things. You're either playing a card out or you're doing a new action ability that is on the card or you're attacking with a card. Those are the three things you get to do. And if someone plays a creature out, then you can use one of your two mind bugs to say, no, I'd rather have that creature instead. And it plays just like that. You need to t cause three damage to your opponent. Then the game is over. You shuffle it up and you go again. And this is an expand alone to the original Mindbug. Yeah. Just so. This one has 
the actions are new. The fact that one of the things you can do on your turn is use an action that's on a card. And they've these... completely blown up your options. I there's, know. Right? <laughs> there's 50% more options now. <laughs> it's so true. And now you can, uh, there's evolution. So some cards, when you activate them, you bring in a different card and it slowly evolves. There's three, three different levels of evolution to some of these cards. And that's kind of interesting as well. How is that managed? You just have to fish out the appropriate card from a side deck? Yeah, well, like I said, there's not they don't all evolve, so you have right. there's like three different creatures that evolve. So I it's see. not a, a giant ask to just say, you know, walk over the side. Butterfly played this with me. She enjoyed it, which was surprising. I still enjoy Mind Bug just for its simplicity and speed of play. Butterfly and I also played Abandon oh, no, All Artichokes. Is I, it was, a, I was going to say something sooner or later. <laughs> this is something uh, we talked about before. It's a very simple game. You start the game with 10 artichokes in your hand. You draw five, and then you start drafting these cards from the center that let you uh, compost artichokes out of your hand in all sorts of different ways. And then at the end of your turn, you draw back up to five cards. And if at that time, out of those five cards, you have no artichokes in your hand, then you've won the game. I do appreciate that they take a strong no artichoke stand. Given that artichokes are vile and disgusting, they're awful. Uh, you agree? It's a, it's a heartless game, Mark. <laughs> I, I thought, given, a, I thought, given your heads. enthusiasm for Italian food, you'd be more pro artichoke. True. Abandon all artichokes, designed by Emma Larkins and published by Game Right. Played a whole bunch of games of Crazy Tower. Crazy Tower is a dexterity game that Walker showed me once and then refused to play with me ever again, and so I had to go get my own copy. Walker is responding with indignation now, but I assure you that all my charges are 100% true. At any rate, Crazy Tower is a very simple block-laying game. What you do is you put out these cards, and the cards lay out grids about where you're allowed to put blocks and where you're not allowed to put blocks. In addition, there are some special powers, but those powers don't trigger in the solo game, which is what I was mostly playing with. In the solo game, you're mostly just trying to complete the tower without it toppling over, and there's about two dozen or more different restrictions that you can apply to yourself. Some of them are relatively straightforward, such as only use your off-dominant hand. Some of them get slightly trickier, like no two blocks of the same shape may be on the same level of the tower. And then there's the one that I very foolishly attempted with, without success. Only one block per level of the tower. That Oof. did not go well at all. But anyway, I had a great deal of fun playing around with it. Just the added c restriction of the random placement of the dead zones of the cards, but where you're not allowed to place blocks is great. And there's also this idea of you're not allowed to have two blocks of the same color on the same level. This drives both the solo play and the multiplayer play because the rate at which the tower grows is somewhat flexible in both contexts because you're not always obligated to go up a level. Unless, of course, you're playing with Walker. Walker uh, is, is definitely, this is not a criticism, Walker is definitely of the risk-taking variety when it comes to such competitive games. So he will always push the limits of what is feasible. But perhaps in a table not involving Walker, you might be able to go a, few, a, a round or two without the tower growing uh, in height in very much the same way that in other groups when playing Skull, you might be able to make a full round without Walker making a bid. Walker shaking his head in, 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 <laughs> in disbelief. At any rate, Crazy Tower is very much of the cheap and cheerful variety of dexterity game. I quite enjoy it. There's also a, a, a 1v all mode where one player is openly trying to cause the tower to topple not on their turn, which seems potentially interesting. I really like Crazy Tower. I'm interested in trying it some more. This was designed by Alexis Harvey, Félix Leblanc, Manuel Lucas, Bergeron Duhamel, and Mathieu Auger. Published by Synapses Games. It's been published in a number of different versions, but the one I have, the one that's most recently available, was published in 2020. Mark, you and I also got to play a game of Empire's Age of Discovery. This is designed by Glenn Drover and published by Eagle Griffin Games. So it is essentially a worker placement game where you don't actually carry out the actions of where you put your workers immediately. You sort of fill all the spots so you can sort of gauge what you're going to do and what's important at that time. And also gauge when things are going to happen. And one of the actions is to colonize new worlds. So you're going to take the workers you place there and they're going to flood the new world and populate it depending on, you know, once you get three there, then things start to happen. Yeah, that's an appropriate verb, flood. And then ev after every three turns, there's a scoring round for sort of ma uh, area majority in all of the different areas. There's also sort of trading goods that you have to collect and there is buildings that you build that do all sorts of different things, uh, immediate effects, game long effects, and end of game scoring effects. The comment is always made when we play this game is, why don't we play this more? This game is amazing. Well, one of the reasons why is the theme. I would never play Empire's Age of Discovery in Mixed Company because this is one of the last games of its ilk that's just one of those un 
unapologetic sort of celebrations of the colonization of the quote-unquote new world. Uh, so I find the theme incredibly distasteful, far more so as time goes on. This is not to say that I won't play it. It's just, again, I wouldn't want to introduce it to people I didn't know, people who were at all confused about my stance on colonialism or anything of that sort, and I could definitely understand why a large number of people will quite legitimately never want to touch such a game with a 10-foot pole. And that's fine. I respect that to no end. Yeah, it's That's like, one reason. It's 100% does not take into account Anything other than a land grab. Yeah. That it really was. But anyway, yes, it is bad. Oh, well, no, you, you, you actively suppress and oh. suborn indigenous populations in the pro- Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. real bad. Never mind. Now, it, the game itself doesn't necessarily put on a moral sheen, but at the same time, eh, it kind of does. So, very, very awkward making in that sense. This was originally published as Age of Empires 3, but then they lost the license of the real-time strategy game of the same name, and then it became Empires Age of Discovery. This was one of the earliest worker placement games to do two things. Number one, to have ridiculous overproduction in terms of components. Remember back in the day when worker placement games just had discs or cubes or something? Or meeples, yeah. Well, this went, no, Meeples, this is before oh, the Age of Meeples. Before Meeples. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, Empire's Age of Discovery, you have little plastic miniatures for all your workers. At the time, this was regarded as an obscene overindulgence. And now it's just, hey, look, here are your figures. <laughs> the other thing that it did very early on is that when it was first published, it was it was kind of sort of in the first wave of post-Agricola worker placement games. And the fact that it did two things was very, very interesting at the time. And it remains very interesting to me now. Number one, the juxtaposition of worker placement in area majority. There's a colonist dock where you set up a little queue to go off to the area majority contest. And that fills up at varying rates. There's usually a series of rushes over the course of the round. And... Area majority scoring, unlike Glendover's other game, Mosaic, where area majority is somewhere between a quarter and a third of your final score, area majority scoring in Empire's Age of Discovery is far more consequential. The other stuff around that tends to be the thing that's a quarter to a third of your score, and area majority is the rest. And I really like that. I love area majority games. And the other thing that it does is you get to have specialized workers, and the specialized workers are better at some things and can serve as other things. In terms of sheer gameplay, it's probably my second favorite worker placement game after Tribune, tied with uh, a variety of Uwe Rosenbergs at various moments. But again, uh, the, my primary objection is to the theming of it. Uh, it was rethemed to a sci-fi version, but in the process it was redeveloped, and I've never played it, but it looks real bad, and reports are real bad. We should try it sometime. What, 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 do you remember the name offhand? Uh, Glenn Drover's Galactic Empires. Gotcha. I, I am interested. Well, well, we'll give it a try someday, because at the very least there, space colonialism is less objectionable, although not problem three, when compared to actual colonialism. Yeah, I, I love the gameplay. Shame about the theme. That's on, the upshot. On the topic of weird themes, Mark, we st- I streamed a game this Saturday that had an odd theme. This is a game called Jerusalem Anno Domi. This is designed by Carmen Garcia Menes, first-time female designer, published by Devia Games, and the object of the game is to sit close to Jesus at the Last Supper, which is kind of odd. So you are... I don't know about odd. It's definitely unprecedented in more games. So it's very much a... You're playing action cards to do varying different sort of actions, putting uh, uh, followers out at the Last Supper, and you want to play them on your board in a certain way because to put apostles out, you need to have exactly the same sort of sequence of cards that go to that row of apostles so at any return if you have the right sequence you can cash them in and there are three different types of apostles and they give you different abilities when you put them at the table of the last supper and overall it was a great game i would watch the video because you got to see me crying again as usual because <laughs> well, judas yeah. mark judas yeah, Ju- judas showed up as my it, understanding it's so, it, so mean like it, yeah. it's one of these things where I, I i set things up and then and then someone plays the game to win like how dare they <laughs> And and then I whine about it. I remain very curious about its overall treatment of the Last Supper as an event. Uh, just the idea of someone playing Judas Iscariot as the worst ever party crasher. It's just, I guess you're right. In terms of theming, it is kind of odd. There was actually a, a, a passage in the textbook expecting that a whole bunch of people will be trying it because they were interested primarily from a faith-based orientation rather than from a hobby orientation. And they're like, don't worry, it looks really complicated, but it's all really easy. And I'm like, oh boy. I definitely uh, wouldn't say that. It, well, it, it's, a, it's, it's a mid-weight Euro, 
And for a lot of non-hobbyist gamers, even very lightweight Euros are completely impenetrable. This is not because they're not intelligent, it's because they're not used to it. And it can be very hard sometimes. And I, I, I definitely don't want it to be seen that, that we think it's weird for other reasons. Like, we've seen all sorts of weird things done with Asian culture. 100%. And the silliness of how their religions are represented. Cashing in Buddhist philosophy yeah, and cashing yeah, in... Yeah, yep, so yep. I don't want to reflect that, oh, it's finally a Roman Catholic thing, so we think it's weird. It is not that. It is just this particular part of the Roman Catholic religion is, you know... Is it centered on... Is it specifically Roman Catholic? No, I'm okay. sure there are others. I don't want... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Catholic. Sorry, Catholic. I shouldn't say Roman Catholic. Uh, Christian. Christian. Uh, beliefs. The Last Supper, specifically. Seems odd. But I enjoyed it. It was a great game. Lots of trade-offs. Very much uh, plain to get those sequences, to get the, the apostles out. So you can look at the top of every row and say, okay, well, I can start that one. With the cards that I have, I have two or three of those cards. So out of those three cards that I have in my hand, which one is better now? And then the next one and the next one. So you have three rows that you can sort of space cards out to mm-hmm. sort of complete your sequences. All of that was very interesting. I would play it again. That is Jerusalem and Domini by Devia Games. On the topic of Glenn Drover, return to Raccoon Tycoon now. Raccoon Tycoon is the very simple auction slash economic management euro by Forbidden Games of 2018. But I have to report a terrible tragedy. One of them, it was foreseeable. And that is we played it with three players. I played it with both of the Louis, and they very much had wanted to play it again. With three, it's not all that great. It moves along at a very, very good clip. Was that reflected by everyone at the end of the game? Uh, everyone agreed that it would, that it was better the time we played it with four. As to whether or not it is worth playing with three, I didn't go that far, but everyone enjoyed themselves anyway. It's just the market doesn't move very much when you're playing it with three. And so the market manipulation, that importance of timing, is less consequential. You're less able to exert those kind of wedges that that either exploit your tempo advantage or your money advantage or other kind of advantage to, to, to great benefit. So kind of an evening out process. And so turns seemed a lot less consequential overall. And the economy was just overall less interesting. The other great tragedy, and I can't believe this happened. I'm, I'm just, I'm more stunned than anything it's else. It's kind of baffling, really. It, it, it's, it's so strange. In Raccoon Tycoon, there are a variety of different railways. There's Fat Cat Railways. There's Top Dog Railways. There's Skunk Works Railways. I, you might be noticing a theme with great little illustrations of the little animals as, as robber barons. But with three players, you don't play with the raccoons. What? So you didn't play Raccoon Tycoon? No, clearly not. You just played Tycoon. Uh, Yeah, exactly. With four players, you take out the skunks. Fine. But then with three players, you take out the raccoons. Why have you done this? This makes no sense. Anyway, so I I played a sort of weird airsats version of Raccoon Tycoon. I'm still vaguely curious in the redevelopment, namely Lizard Wizard. This is Lizard Wizard, not King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Which apparently introduces some additional things, spells you can cast, various other things. But I do kind of appreciate the sort of cute animals as robber barons aesthetic. So I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know about reptilian sorcerers, quite frankly, as a consequence. But look, I do really like Glenn Drubber, Generally speaking, not all his designs have been to my taste. A lot of his uh, sort of work-like uh, hatchet job by the numbers, like Conquest of the Empire, that he's just like, oh, I'll take this design and kind of mash it into something new. That doesn't really do much for me. And I, I have nothing against Railways of the World, but it's so clearly der- derivative of Age of Steam that it feels more like a slight tweaking than a full-fledged design. But his actual full-fledged designs, again, like Empire's Age of Discovery, like Mosaic, like Raccoon Tycoon, have been, I've, I found, very pleasing. And so... I'd be happy to go back to Raccoon Tycoon, but probably with more players. It is a great, very, very approachable economic Euro for four or five players with very, very quick turns. And nonetheless, with some interesting decisions to make about how to manipulate the market. So that's Raccoon Raccoon Tycoon, at least when you're playing with at least four. You and I got to play my new copy of Agricola 15, or 15 Agricola, 15th year anniversary. And we played with the B deck. This is designed by Uwe Rosenberg and published by... Lookout Games. Unfortunately, we then discovered that my anniversary copy was missing parts, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> so, we always enjoy Agricola. This was no different. Uh, the deck was very unique. It didn't it didn't really uh, sing of a theme for me. Usually when you see a deck, you can see what sort of they were going for and sort of like a running sort of, you know, go heavy on food or go heavy on something or, you know, some sort of mechanic within the cards that helps you you know, synergize. I didn't see it. Maybe it was just the cards that I had. 
My recollection is that the A and B decks don't really lean into that too, too much. It's mostly the smaller decks. I don't have much experience with the C and D decks, certainly not the new ones. And I I don't know if I've ever found a, like a really heavy theme. This is to be contrasted with, say, Holler Tau. Holler Tau, there is kind of sort of a little bit of a mini theme in, 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 uh, in the later decks that you're going to find in the decks of cards there. But maybe, I guess we've just had different experiences with the different Agricola decks. Could be, like I said, always fun with Agricola. Had a great game. Agricola. Yeah, I think we'll be talking about Agricola again later on when we uh, start talking about completionism. Probably. Yes. Play the game of Cacti. Cacti is by John Cloudus of Small Box Games. It is indeed a small box. It is just a deck of cards consisting mostly of the aforementioned Cacti. There's a review copy sent to us by the designer. It, like almost every other John Cloudus game, is a two-player game. And I have to say that Cacti has an incredibly admirable stripped-down simplicity to it in the realm of order fulfillment. It is basically a set collection order fulfillment game. There are cacti from the middle of the board, and then there are all these sales that you can make. And indeed, every card is double-sided. On one side is a cactus, or a cacti is the rule say, which is perfectly legitimate. You can talk about a cacti, that's fine. And on the other side is an order that might require three of some kind of cacti or two of some kind of other cacti and can be worth various amounts. And on your turn, you more or less either take all of a single kind of uh, cactus from the, the middle of the display, or you satisfy an order. But every time you take cacti, your opponent can do the same after you've taken uh, taken it. So say there's three of one kind and two of another. If you take all the three of one kind, they can take the two leftover ones. So generally speaking, that is not getting too much of an advantage over your opponent on that turn. Or they can make a sale of their own. So managing the tempo from that perspective was surprisingly interesting. What I found less interesting was that the game was so short and the the score margin was so small that the score, the, the the winning score was entirely determined by luck because what happened was everyone has a favorite kind of cactus over the course of play. It became relatively transparent what my favorite course of cactus was. And the very last turn of the game, uh, four of my favorite kind of cactus came up. So I was like, all right, sure. (laughs) And that was it. And I just took those four cacti as my last turn. And that was game. And uh, that that was a little bit of an unpleasant ending. But other than that, I mean, look, I have been complaining about order fulfillment over the course of the past few years. It seems to be the central element, or at least a central element, of every medium or heavier Euro game of the past few years. And so initially I looked at, at Cacti and I'm thinking, oh, God, another order fulfillment game. Honestly, though, it reminds me of some of the s- simpler games of Alan Moon around the turn of the century. Like, it very much has that sort of ticket-to-ride purity of it of just managing the flop of cards, managing tempo, and trying to satisfy very particular orders. And so I was I was very taken by Cacti. I'd happily play it again. It's, it takes all of two minutes to explain and maybe all of ten minutes to play. So it was very impressive from that perspective. And that's Cacti from John Cloudus at Small Box Games. I'm going to talk about two games at the same time because I felt the same about both. We played them both. <laughs> One is called Company of Heroes. We pretty well played second edition. Uh, yes. This is di- designed by Brian Cromery and put out by Bad Crow Games. And the second is Darkest Dungeon, the board game, designed by Nick Noitis and Algiris Pung Yoris, published by Mythic Games. So these are both giant crowdfunding projects with a ton of plastic. And both licensed from video game properties. Just so. And there are a ton of things in both of these games that I really like, and then things that I hate. <laughs> well, why don't, why don't you so, break it down? So, in both Company cases, of though. Heroes, fantastic miniatures, great implementation of the feel of the video game. They have all these points on the map. You go out, you capture them. It increases your production. Everything sort of makes sense. How how you move, uh, how you lock down areas, how you engage other. Uh, Units, how you upgrade units, how you put out units. What sort of is the immediate disconnect is just the weird combat system. Not that it's overly complicated or anything. It just, in comparison to the rest of the game, it's just not intuitive like the rest of the game is. Really? I feel. And, can... and, and the speed of how the other games, the rest of the game flows, like moving, you know, you spend your things, you move, you done, and then, then combat happens. And it really slows the game down so much. Because a game like this, it, the rules are so simple, right? And I think that's what aids to how fun the game is. Because if you start adding a whole bunch of stuff, it would bog it down, and it would make it unfun. And I think that's what sort of the combat system does. So I think I think there's two things to be said in defense of the combat system of Combat of Heroes. 
uh, sorry, not co- Company of Heroes. All all of these World War II video games titles are interchangeable to me. Honestly, I find it very difficult to keep to keep them straight. Company of Heroes has a system whereby every attack is of a certain kind of damage, and the unit, based on its attributes, mostly whether it's infantry or light vehicle or heavy vehicle, will either get to roll a defense against it or not. If it doesn't roll defense, it just takes a point of damage. Simple, straightforward. If it does have defense, well then, there is a two-thirds chance that they will not take damage from that thing. The only other complicating factor on top of that is because we've chosen to use these quote-unquote advanced rules for high explosives. So the maximal complexity of a single combat resolution is, okay, my vehicle does two points of anti-infantry damage and one point of high explosive damage. Okay, I roll defense against the high explosive, I failed. Okay, now I roll damage for the high explosive. That's as complicated as it gets. What it, what actually makes it complicated is the fact that we were playing a four-player game, and so we were playing on a huge map flooded with units. Even though it was just a short duration scenario there was just a lot of things in and around moving in and around i think the fact that we found it so easy to maneuver and manage these large forces in comparison to the combat resolution is a testament i think less to the clunkiness of the of the combat resolution and more to the cleanliness of everything else personally the other thing i would note is is that we were going slowly just so that everyone could internalize everything that was happened we could have easily streamlined things true if we were willing to do things simultaneously or just manage things board by board probably true that having been said i will repeat my earlier criticism i'm glad it feels like the video game because it certainly doesn't feel like anything else no it's 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 it is as related to any notion of my understanding of warfare or any other board game's representation of World War II combat as, say, disc golf is related to orbital bombardment. Like, it's just, there's, there's yeah. no comparison. Yeah, there's no sort of holding a position. There's no sort of grindiness. There's no, there's like... You no supply, getting, no morale. Yeah, stuff, Anybody can go anywhere. Yeah, it's, it's Stuff is getting eliminated and you just repurchase it and put it back out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's complete lunacy. But it's meant for, honestly, I think what it's for is made evident by listening to Huey and Dewey, and to a certain extent you as well, and sometimes me, but hardly ever, be able to be like, oh, wow, look how cool this tiger is, right? I I honestly think that's what it is, because they look cool. They're these big, chunky, cool-looking plastic toys. As far as an excuse to play with toys goes, Company of Heroes is doing pretty well. That's just not where I happen to be at my stage of the hobby, necessarily. Next up, Darkest Dungeon. So it has the typical sort of campaign system uh, lineup. You have a sort of town phase. You have a sort of wandering around a large dungeon. And then when you get into an encounter, there's a sort of skirmish, put out miniatures type phase. Precisely. Now, two of these phases are amazing. <laughs> I, I didn't so go far as amazing. Two of these phases are good. Okay. One of these phases is nightmarish and <laughs> can die in a fire. So which the, phase is that, Walker? This is the sort of the spider web sort of moving around the dungeon phase. Sure, I thought you were gonna. I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure which one you're gonna pick, which I think doesn't bode well for the game. But <laughs> I thought it was that one. So you're you're told about what all of these counters to get out for this particular dungeon. And then you mix them up and you put them at all the locations and then you blindly go around yes, <laughs> trying to find the ones you want. And every time you move, you roll these dice and hey, stress, 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 stress. Yep. Move your stress, move your stress, you know, yep. take damage. And it's just this constant. I understand. I understand <laughs> that this is what Darkest Dungeon is all about. Yes. But I really feel that the video game does it sort of behind the scenes and in a much quicker and satisfying way than this particular part of the game. Video games can do attrition much better than board games can. Video games can do grinding much better than board games can. It's not surprising, therefore, that this segment doesn't really work in a board gaming contest. Because the town phase is great. You draw a town card. It tells you how many days you got. You have all the normal things. Health. Get stuff back. Buy items. Do things. And then you do the awful spiderweb thing. And then you go into combat, which is very much reflects the video game as well. You, you put yourselves in the ranks because in Darkest Dungeon, you get, you know, only certain abilities depend on where you are in a, this two-dimensional linear lineup of your party. And you move the figures around and they sort of 
you know, break the third wall in a way. It's like if you push, not only do you push up in the in the line, but you also push the person, the enemy back. In the, it's on entirely the map. arbitrary, and it exists only because it is aping the conventions of the video game. And if you try to think about it, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, but it, it in some it cases works. It, it's, it works. Yeah, it but works, it's, but it's absurd. But I wouldn't say arbitrary because some some of the monsters have a limited range and limited movement. And if you push them far enough back, then they can't attack you on their next turn. Sure, but that doesn't. Th- there's no connection. There's no connective tissue no, I see between your nominal rank and where you are on the board. Just so. Your rank says that Walker is the tank and is in the front of the line, but the board says that Walker went off to the side somewhere to go look at something, and so the healer is nominally now on the front lines because they both try to represent space, but they're representing entirely different spaces. <laughs> now, it's very hard for any campaign game Due to the Gloomhaven factor, right? Yes. You you have this fantastic campaign system that's out there. So in Darkest Dungeon, you have, at the beginning, I'm not sure how long, how long does it take to get a fourth ability? A fourth? Oh, well, it depends on how many experience points you get and how much you save. Probably if you're, if you're uh, careful, it would take you two dungeons to level up at a, at a, at a minimum. And that's if you're not leveling up your other abilities. So that even then. Now you have four different cards. Like Gloomhaven, you have a, usually a deck of 10 yep. that you're going to cycle through and, and do all sorts of different cool things. This one, you get three at the beginning, and you're just going through the same three actions over yep. and over again. And it is a little grindy, but a lot of the parts of the game do reflect the video game. And the miniatures are fantastic. The art is fantastic. The story is so-so, but when read with a fantastic voice, brings you into the sort of you know, the theme. Huey like- has a marvelous narrator voice. He does the narrate. He does a great impression of the narrator of Darkest Dungeon. So the first time we played, mostly I was thinking, oh, this is an overwhelming number of different cards that are very poorly differentiated from each other. But the miniatures do a wonderful job of mimicking the aesthetic of the actual video game. And they've done a surprisingly good job of importing a lot of the conventions. And so structurally, I was kind of impressed from that perspective. And then this, uh, the second time we played, we basically played one and a half dungeons. And having gotten over my being strictly impressed, it's, uh, this is garbage. This is like straight, straight garbage. Because we did one dungeon where there was absolutely no fighting. It consisted entirely of just rolling dice and applying the effects. I'd rather play Welcome 2 than a dungeon like that, to be frank. And the combat is barely any better because, as you say, you're just pinging the same abilities over and over and you're just managing the upkeep. Uh, it's not it's not too too cumbersome, but most of the actual leveraging you're getting in terms of gameplay is just managing all these bleed and stun and buff and debuff counters. The fact that it's workable, again, structurally, is a minor miracle. I don't care, though, because it's not in service of any actual gameplay elements. It's just straight garbage. So if you just really want to, if you've, if you've finished Darkest Dungeon on the PC, but you desperately just want to spend a little bit more time in that world, I guess maybe... But past that, ugh, I, I don't see any any reason to... Not not over the plethora of other better campaign games that are out there. Yeah, and if you want tactical combat, geez, there's any number of great co-op tactical combat games out there. We talk about them all the time. And if you want to play a campaign game, again, you're probably not, like, you're probably not done with Gloomhaven and Frosthaven. I think Oathsworn is amazing. Uh, any number of other things, but... Uh, I'll, I'll be very surprised if we ever return to Darkest Dungeon, the board game. Published by Mythic Games. Yeah, I was... I got it because Huey loves Darkest Dungeon. And Huey suggested we play it. And I'm like, okay. Huey's game for almost anything. When he suggests something... I'm glad we played it this one last time. Because <sighs> otherwise it might be niggling. And it's like, oh, maybe there was something. Maybe it's just the first time. And... I'm glad we could satisfy Huey's curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say the same thing if I attended like Huey's amateur taxidermy. I'm glad we could satisfy his curiosity. <laughs> that doesn't make it a valuable experience. And those are the games we played last week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Let's start with the big one. So many of you are probably already aware that Into the Unknown, publishers of Aeon, Aeon Trespass Odyssey, currently up for its uh, reprint on Kickstarter, accused Quackalope, content creator and, I guess we'll say, influencer, of basically extortion. We take no position on whether or not these claims are accurate, because, quite frankly, we don't think that that's the important thing. The important thing that we believe in, and this is I said this already on Bloat, so if you've heard this on Bloat, this is the same statement. 
The bigger problem is, broadly speaking, the state of board game media, that we have a large number of people with large followings and apparently a large degree of influence who take money for pay-to-play videos and simultaneously engage in so-called critical content, reviews or what have you, with the same publishers and very often the same exact product that they were already paid to promote. In the rest of the world, ideally there's a difference between advertising and critical content. And the fact that there is no clear differentiation in many areas of board game media is, I think, the bigger problem. So the bigger problem isn't whether or not in this instance people like Quackalope have been engaging in sales practices that were perhaps too high pressure or even outright extortion. The bigger problem is that the, the a large fragment of board game media operates on a pay-to-play basis without proper disclosure and without a proper distinction between editorial content and advertising content. Everything that I was reading about this and watching about this makes it, it very much seems like it's a YouTube problem. Right? I hope lot, I hope it's only a YouTube a problem. A lot of this thing doesn't happen, you know, in in podcasting or or audio parts. I mean, it's all yeah. it's all about it's all about this one thing I watched. The one guy said, "Well, this is what you have to do to make it to the top." And I just went, "What?" <laughs> it's like you know, you know, you have to you know get the thumbnails just right. You have to take this money from the from you know the publishers. You know, if you want to be at the top of board game content, these are the things you have to do. And I just went, "No, <laughs> no, it is not. It depends on what you think the top is." Well put, right? And. And, and like I always say, looking back, are you going to be proud of this so-called top that you made it to at right. the end of the day? And I, I consume lots of other material on YouTube. I watch tech reviews. I watch movie reviews. They don't engage in behavior like this. Broadly speaking, there's an accepted understanding, even amongst amateur tech reviewers, that you say where you got the product. And if you got it from a, a if you got it for free, you say so. And then generally, there's also the additional proviso of all opinions are my own, and they don't, they haven't seen this this review before I pu- published it. And in point of fact, it's illegal in the United States, technically, not that that's going to get you very far, to not disclose if you get something for free or if you got blandishment. I mean, honestly, it's all of a piece, and it's I, I, quite frankly, I found it dispiriting when when this news blew up. And I had a, a chance to reflect on the relative influence and the relative value that is accorded to a variety of voices in media and the value of voices in YouTube that engage simultaneously in quote-unquote reviews as well as pay-to-play videos, I found it very, very, very dispiriting. And that, I think, is the bigger problem, not whether this particular instance went down in a specific way. Not to not to minimize either the reputational harm if it's a false accusation or the actual harm to the victim if, it, if, if, if it's a true accusation. That actually matters. But I think that there's a bigger issue at play, and that's what I find more salient, to be frank. Another side issue, which I thought was odd, that there was a was a thread on Board Game Geek ah. about this situation on the unknown on the game page itself that had no deleted comments, but was locked for some reason for a period of time. And yeah, and, thought, and, with, and with no moderator announcement as to why. No. Yeah, that's odd. I just thought it was odd. On occasion, I've seen moderators show up and say, "We think that this this discussion has." reached a, 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 a reasonable endpoint, but usually that's after, you know, the same point's been made half a dozen times by both sides, and there have been a series of deleted posts because they were antagonistic or ad hominem uh, or what have you. But it, it, it is somewhat unusual that it was temporarily locked for no apparent reason. Now on to better stuff. Indeed. Mark, there's a game coming out that is called Cover Your Cookies by Grandpa <laughs> Beck's Games. Wait, 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 wait. And I think it's... a aptly named oh, right boy. because here we go here, we go. here because, i'm ready i'm no walker I'd wait say, just let me let me let me let me get fully prepared for what you're about to unleash well the cuppies, cu- cookies are disgusting so you do want to in fact cover them <sighs> so aptly named game cover your cookies grandpa bex games <laughs> sure <laughs> so the spiel des Jahres, the german game of the year award which is mostly for uh, family level or intro games, has released its nominations. There are three nominations. Dorf Romantic by Michael Palm and Lucas Zack. I still need to try that. Dorf Romantic looks like a, you know, it's a very Have you pleasant. played the computer one yet? Dorf Romantic? No. Yeah. Well, you should try that first. I've not yet heard anything good about the, the board game version. I've heard, I've heard good things about Have it. Have you? All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, then there you go. Fun Facts by Casper Lapp. Fantastic game. We both know. Uh, well, uh, me more so. I'm not a huge fan of Fun Facts. I also... I also think that it's an indication. Again, I keep thinking like 
Back in the Day, the kind of things that were nominated. And Next Station London by Matthew Dunstan. I have no opinion on that game whatsoever. It's a, it's a, it's a roll and write. There's also the Kennerspiel des Jahres, which is supposed to be for the, uh, the, 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 the sort of connoisseur or cognoscenti. Challengers by Johannes Krenner and Marcus Slavicek, which I've heard so many different reports of, so as to be thoroughly curious. Its detractors call it war. Its defenders call it war, but fun. I'm <laughs> very curious to see it in action. Iki by Koto Yamada. We've reviewed it. We're, we're both. Yeah, but how long? It feels like we've had it for years. It is strange. It must have just been published in Germany. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, the original version of Iki, well, and then it was republished yeah, by Sorry We Are French. Yeah, yeah it's the, been out for a while. The original was 2015. Yeah, exactly. So at least eight years old. But whatever. They have their own criteria just as, as yeah. we have our own criteria. But we like Iki. It's a, great, it's a great game. This is probably the heaviest game that they've nominated in some time. Yeah. And not that that necessarily makes it better. I'm just commenting in terms of the, the natural class of games they tend to focus on. And Planet Unknown by Ryan Lambert and Adam Rayberg. I love Planet Unknown. It's great. It's a wonderful little polyama game. So Well, little. It's big physically, little in in concept. So good luck to all the nominees. And there's also, of course, going to be the Kinderspiel, which we don't really deal too, too much with children's games per se. But uh, good luck to all the nominees of both the SDJ and the KDJ. Both K's DJ. So those who like Nirishima Hex, there is yet another faction coming out. This one will be called the Merchant's Guild. I love that Portal Games is still supporting Nirishima Hex. And then Catalyst Game Labs. These are people that have done uh, Shadowrun games, Battletech games, uh, The Duke, I believe they did as well. They have now deca- dedicated a whole section of their business to board game, board games only. And their next, their first thing coming out uh, on Kickstarter soon is going to be called Overlords in Training, which is going to be a card game. So hopefully soon to come from them will be Battletech themed games, that would be amazing. On that topic, I had meant to announce it when I first read about it, there is going to be in Target a new version of the Battletech starter set. And once again, I love the fact I just had a conversation with a border guard the other day, actually, and uh, they made a disparaging comment about, well, you know, certainly better than the kinds of games you get at Target. I'm like, eh, don't sleep on Target selection. Any any game store where you can get Gloomhaven and Battletech, not the Battletech's the best ever, but I mean, there's a and Spirit Island. That's already a pretty solid cross section of, of of hobbyist marketing. So, yeah, comparatively to other big box stores, they've got it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They definitely got on lock. And besides, you can walk into pretty much any big box store in, in Canada or the United States and pick up code names. So that alone means that you're going to find something worth playing. And so I, I love the fact that the mass market and the hobby market are seeing more and more overlap. It can only be good things for the hobby. Agreed. That is the news and why it doesn't matter. Now on to the topic, which is completionism. Gotta catch them all. <laughs> so Walker. Yes, Mark. Well, there's two here. There's two. Right? I'm, and I'm wondering. <laughs> there's two what? Well, there's <laughs> we two. We haven't even started. Well, I'm just wondering. There, there's two categories, and, and I was reading something where they said that, that this was different, but sort of the same, right? Okay. There is fo- what they call FOMO, fear of missing out. Yes. And completionism. Do you, do you think that is all encompassing, or do you think they are definitely two different things? Uh, I think sometimes they can be different things, but by and large, to my understanding, they both point at the same, well, in the context of fear of missing out of having everything, then they're the same thing. If it's fear of missing out of having any other thing, well, then they're different. I really feel, though, when you think about it, Pokemon is a great sort of analogy. <laughs> right? Because you have your rare Pokemons, you yeah. have your your different levels, which are the expansions. You know, you got to have all the different evolutions of the Pokemon, and there's so many Pokemon. Are we talking about, are, okay, are we talking about the video game, the universe, or the card game? I don't know. I've only watched the cartoon. I've you done, only I've done <laughs> nothing else of okay. Pokemon. Okay. In the cartoon, I don't, I don't remember them talking about, like, levels of rarity. Well, you know, they have, and I think it's in the first episode, you have that big bird that flies over and it's like the thing. There are, there are, there is some talk of rarity in the. Right. In the yeah. Show. You know, and, and the, 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 but they don't really talk about specific. No, not at all. Certainly not in the sense of like the cards or in the, maybe in the video game. They don't really, anyway, sorry, minor digression, <laughs> former Pokemon master of Canada here. And I, I, I want to ask, I want to start off this as well. The conversation's already be, begun, sorry, but. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me ask you something, because the topic came up in the context of a very specific game that you have very strong thoughts about. It's true. 
I just want to say one very oh, quick. Oh, come on. Look, look, I'm so, I can't get I, started here. You can't right. get started. Fine, I just fine. want to make sure that people know that this is not a negative thing. We're not saying anyone that has completion things that it's a bad thing. Ooh, well, oh, I, I'm not willing to commit to that overall. Well, I just don't want to. I'm not judging anybody. Exactly. This That's, is what I'm saying. Yes. You no, know, no. But I, I can say that something's a bad thing without necessarily judging somebody. There's, there's, there's a difference. But anyway. All right. All right. So this, you're saying this comes up in the, in the context of a specific game. <laughs> you, the topic came up originally in the context of a specific game. And that game is unmatched. Yes, and I've got another one, too, because it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same? There's 20 sets of Unmatched. There's Mark. 20 sets of Unmatched. There's also Ooh. 20 sets of Smash Up. Hmm. Now, I'm going to okay. th- throw this both as as the same. Like, okay. People, the whole, the whole thing started was, do I feel as though companies take advantage, because I feel as though in this hobby of ours, uh, board game collecting and completionism mm-hmm. is hand in hand. Now, are companies taking advantage of this fact by continually putting out, I don't want, product? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you qualify the product? No, no, that's okay. I, Why don't you characterize? No, 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 come, Walker, come on. Okay. Substandard product. This is a safe space. Your job is to issue opinions on board games. Subst- don't pull your punches sub-standard now. Substandard product in, in knowing that people will buy it because they want to have it all. Okay. Question. Do you think, I agree with you that Unmatched is a substandard game. It's not not to my taste. The hand plays you. You don't play the hand, more or less. It's, it's, it, that having been said, it's a skirmish game, so I'll happily play even bad skirmish games. Do you think the people who publish Unmatched think that it's a substandard game? Ooh, that's a pregnant pause and a half. <laughs> I'm amazed. I, I feel, though, that in this industry, uh, games progressively are getting better. I think by falling back on a title like Unmatched, like Smash Up, like uh, Azul, continually pinging these main titles and not putting out new content, you f- you just feel as though your game is good enough. You should be pushing yourselves to put out better games every time. Wow. Okay. So you think there's a level of active bad faith. In terms of, so let's set aside Azul, all right? Because Azul is more under the, the context of like revisions and second editions. We talked about that in a, in a separate topic. And I don't know that there's the drive amongst Azul enthusiasts to have all the Azuls, right? Like pandemic enthusiasts, there's, there's sort of a, a, a breadth versus depth concern going on here, right? I know a lot of people who want every pandemic expansion, but they don't necessarily want every pandemic version. Of the versions they like, they'll take they'll get all the stuff available for it, but there's only been expansions for one type of pandemic, and that's core pandemic anyway. Well, okay, there was one expansion for the dice game. Sorry, setting all that aside. <laughs> I, I think that products like Smash Up and like Unmatched are of a different kind, right? There's clearly a difference between the different Azul versions and, and the various sets of Unmatched. Do we agree? Yes, one hundred percent. So let's limit let's limit our attention to, to what's going on for Unmatched, because I can't believe you accuse Michael Kiesling of being a hack. All right, so let's 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 do let's, we'll let's compare it. I'm gonna have this big thing, FFG versus Simon in a second. But oh boy, let's, wow, let's, we're brought this is getting broad. Let, let's put this. Uh, let's compare it to Fantasy Flight games in a game like either Imperial Assault or Descent. Okay, which there are uh, so many expansions. That right, Descent Second Edition, Third Edition has only really Correct. had a small number. Yeah, yeah. And then you compare that to an Unmatched, where in in Imperial Assault they're continually putting out new. Well, it's, I guess it's new units on match as well, but different rules, more stuff, and it just seems oh a lot. Good. It just seems like a lot more to me than the unmatched, just the same gameplay, but instead, you know, this character has two strength instead of one strength. Oh my goodness! Holy crap! And the, and the cards are green instead of red. Mark. No, hold difference. on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And the map, <laughs> the maps. This one's purple instead of <laughs> instead of orange. Hold on, hold on. Woof. Wow, there's a lot. You just said a lot. <laughs> and I just need to... First of all, I just want to say that in terms of appearance, uh, whatever else one might want me to say about Unmatched, it has some of the best graphic design of, that I've seen in years in terms of the, the quality of the design of the tokens, the design of the card backs. They're beautiful. Absolutely stunning, first of all. Secondly, I can't believe that you're going to tell me with a straight face... It sounded odd when it came out of my mouth. <laughs> no, no, okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you a chance to retract it. But there's a straight face that a good example 
of a company not number one not exploiting completionism and number two curating quality limited content is fantasy flight managing star wars properties is that seriously what you're going to tell me yeah, like i said it sounded, it sounded really bad when it came out <laughs> because, because i i would posit that there is no i don't think you can argue that there's daylight between the way ffg managed imperial assault and the way restoration is managing unmatched I don't think you can argue that there's much daylight between those two. Well, I feel as though because you can play any character against any character in Unmatched, uh-huh. that they're all very balanced and and kind of samey. Ooh, actually, one of my disagree, one of my well, problems with Unmatched is they don't strike me as very well balanced at all within reason. <laughs> but they want them to be in theory, yeah. Whereas the this is very light and so superficial, but I've got to come up with something now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh my goodness! But the character, the different characters, of course, are are balanced. But the monsters are very so incredibly, right? That yeah, you know, that, that that is a is a big difference between the different expansions. Well, but that's setting aside the skirmish mode anyway. Yeah, okay. Because it all enters the big skirmish mode slurry, and in theory, they're all supposed to be balanced for points. For points, yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, here's the. <sighs> And I don't want to. Okay, let, let's 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 talk a little bit more about this, and then we'll try to leave unmatched in the dust because it's th- this is a bigger this is this is a bigger pattern. Because I think you're underestimating the extent to which a game like Unmatched can iterate on its own design principles. The different characters work in very different ways. Yes, they're all just fundamentally. My criticism is the same. They're almost you're just mostly just responding to what you've got in your hand. But uh, you know, the Invisible Man has a a, a weird positioning aspect. Uh, there is a uh, an additional element of bluff when you're playing against Medusa, on top of the fact that she's going to drain all your cards. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> the relative strengths of their sidekicks varies. There's things that they've been doing to play around with those ideas. I don't think, again, when you compare it to the way other systems, other sort of uh, games with lots of error of expansions, and, I mean, we could list tons of them, some of them we like and some of them we don't like. I mean, whether it's Sentinels of the Multiverse, whether it's Too Many Bones, whether it's a given Kickstarter with a whole bunch of different add-ons, even something like Project Elite, uh, whether it's Agricola for crying out loud, right? I, I'm not, look, I'm not going to say that the design, the design work on Unmatched is as good as the design work on the different decks of Agricola, right? But I think that the vision, the, the model that you posited is of a company in bad faith seeking to exploit a negative psychological phenomenon amongst its user base, despite the fact that they know their game is bad. I, being the capitalist that I am, I have say, a slightly sunnier... I went so, 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 so far as saying bad, but, <laughs> but you know... Substandard, substandard. Deficient in some way. Yes. I don't think there's any maybe difference it's, maybe between... because it's, it's just not for me. Commercially speaking, I don't think there's any difference between Restoration Games publishing unmatched expansions because they know or hope they will sell, and Lookout Games publishing Agricola decks because they know or hope they will sell. That is my thesis. We can then discuss... Whether or not, I, no, having I, asserted I just, this equivalency, I, I just think it's a, a a different feel. Like I really, yeah, because you like a and you don't no, like a match. That I, I think no, is the different I, feel. I don't, I don't think so, right? Because there's no, there's no big visual appeal to the expansions of Agricola. It, it, it's just straight up changes the gameplay and gives so? you a better experience. Is is the experience of a game not partially visual? And and the unmatched. Is just it just seems to be giving you these like glitzy IPs every time type thing. I don't know. It just it gives me a much different feel. Okay, it's very much for the same. Uh, I don't, I, uh, okay, well let's set that aside. Yes, then. let's move on. Let's move on from from ragging on unmatched or my 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 character's defensive. Have there been product lines where you Walker have personally felt the need to be all in? Oh yes, like like I just talked about, I have all of Imperial Salt, mm-hmm. Descent. That's I, a lot of Imperial Salt. It is a lot of Imperial Salt. It's a lot what? of Descent. Like really everything. Yes. Well, I did not get. There are they have uh, all the skirmish uh, neoprene mats. Okay. I did not get any. But all of the those. gameplay content. Yes, all you've the got all the game. Content. That's a lot of Imperial Assault. It is. Wow, I really enjoy. Imperial and you got Assault. everything from Second Edition Descent as well. Yes, that's a lot of Descent. Wow, but it went on like big discount, so. That's true. It did. It was there were some sites that had like package deals where you could get a bunch of stuff. Okay, I know that we're we're both uh, have everything from the second edition of Sentinels of the Multiverse. Yes, but and that was that was there was a side to that. Like there are some things I don't I didn't really care like promos. 
like the, oh, that's like true. When, when there's foils and stuff and i could i couldn't care less it's something that when it in, when it, it's just another version of a card that i already have but it's it's shiny i i have no feeling to get that <laughs> well no but we we both got the promo packs for Sentinels of the Multiverse because it contained all the promos Correct. in foil. The fact they were in foil form was academic. Yes, but the, but before that, when we couldn't get them, I didn't feel that I was missing out on anything. You're right. We didn't feel the need to chase down any 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 promos. Uh, so you're right. We I guess we weren't all in until they offered this new and that, product. That's, I'm saying like, that's the same in, in a lot of games. A lot of games there's were conventions that yep. have sort of like the one time sort of handout sprue where you get fancy stuff for a lot sure. of sure. things and, and that doesn't bother me whatsoever i have didn't no, touch that yeah i have no intention you know i don't worry but it's about weird not because having them in sentinels the variant characters do change gameplay sometimes subtly sometimes considerably because it changes their hit points and their starting power why is it that you felt okay was it strictly because of the difficulty of getting them or was it also because you don't really care about variant characters uh, just a little bit about, like, I didn't want to worry about trying to get them. Yeah, it's weird. It, they just felt completely out of reach and, and too much trouble to get. Because I've become much less completionist over time. And actually, it's only very recently, over the past couple of years. But Sentinels of the Multiverse was very much at, like, my peak completionist impulses. And I, too, didn't feel the need to chase down promos. I wonder what it is. It's like it's almost like a separate category in my brain, like, thing I don't have to worry about. Well, then we can go to the other extreme, Mark. What's that? Like we did with Blood Rage, where we specifically ordered in a store promo <laughs> box copy. You're right. So we could loot it for its bits. Yes. So here's the thing. Here is the line in the sand that I've drawn for myself. All right. I'm not pretending that this is some sort of principled stance, and I'm not suggesting that this makes me any better. That like I again, I don't judge people that engage in this in this practice. I don't I in fact go one step further than you and I don't judge retailers and publishers for catering to this impulse necessarily. I mean we're it's not like there's a chemical dependency going on. Well there might actually be. It's tough to tell. But anyway, set again, setting that aside. <laughs> if the game is certainly top twenty, or definitely something that I'm always gonna keep in my collection and is definitely one of my favorites. If there's available bling, I will strongly consider it, right? So the, the the specifically what you're talking about with Blood Rage was bling. It was just turning some of the uh, cardboard trackers into plastic uh, for your retail edition. For my uh, Kickstarter edition, there was also some other stuff that could get, get swapped out for plastic when they'd been cardboard before. There was one, yeah, very big, large one was your player board in all copies. Even the Kickstarter copy was flimsy paper. Yes. Whereas, and so we upgraded them to the cardboard yes. version. Yes. Yes. So that was a big part of it. And then there was also the Kickstarter that they did after that, which gave you the extra clan, which I purchased not out of a sense of completionism, but I purchased so that I could sub out the existing yellow clan because the existing yellow clan is full of TNA. And the new sort of replacement for that, the the, the clan of, of women, was much, much more sensibly dressed. And so I could actually put it in front of people without feeling embarrassed. So there was a reason behind that. But I still have, I don't know, but here I don't know if it's a completionist urge. It's not like, ooh, if I don't have this, I'm going to miss out. Which I did actually feel for a, for a lot of Sentinels of the Multiverse and stuff like that. And for um, other other series that I've kept up to date with. Uh, things like uh, Street Masters. Uh, things like Too Many Bones for a while, but I got off that train. Things like various Kickstarters that I pledged to. Although I, I've, I've become a little more sophisticated. I none when it comes to blinging out games I really love, it's just because I, I like to celebrate the games that are like I have a massive collection. And if I can devote a small amount of money to making a given game that I really appreciate for being unique and worth keeping, I'll do that. I, I think that's a different impulse. So how about for games that you haven't even played yet? So I'm talking about these all in pledges now. Oh boy, yeah. Where from from mostly from I think Simon Games is the the most egregious uh, perpetrator of this where but they don't really do reprints as often that's what i mean that's what that's oh what, yeah yeah so, sure. so right it, so it adds, <laughs> yeah, so it yeah, adds yeah, in yeah. the fomo yeah, yeah. part where if you don't get yeah, it yeah. now then then you'll never get it and and the add-ons keep keep coming and by the time you know it it's like a 500 dollar yes. pledge you're up to and so it's, it's a completionist you want to get it all and you know that if you don't get it now you will not be able to get it again yes so the fact that you can't get it again is a consequence of a whole bunch of market forces, some of which are absolutely a product of this completionist FOMO push in the part of the market. Some of it is other stuff. I don't do, I never really did all in pledges when they were big. 
Uh, sometimes when an all-in pledge is like one expansion or something. Here's my here's a criterion I often have. If it's an entirely new campaign setting or whatever, I can easily let it slide. I figure, eh, whatever. If if I should be so lucky as to exhaust that encounter deck or whatever, then I'll make the effort to find it on the secondary market, if I should be so lucky. I still have a solid weakness, though, and that is characters. New characters to play as, I will go out of my way to try to make sure I get all of those. And that is why, uh, in a, very frequently, in a, in a Simon campaign, typically, when I pledge for Simon campaign now, I do so with the knowledge that I can flip it for whatever I paid for it if I don't like it. And that's been great. But would it, if there's like 17 expansion, I'll be like, okay, well, this one has one hero. Forget it. This one has five new heroes. Okay, I'll get this one. <laughs> That's been my criterion. How do you navigate such things other than just shut up? I want to ignore it. It's it's. I get to hit the button that says pledge and then worry about paying for it later. <laughs> <laughs> well, but how do you decide? So, so in no, such I, ca- it's just one of these things. It's a feeling, right? In my, uh-huh. I, I read the rules and, and hopefully there's a, a tabletop simulator and I sort of yep. like you know, work through it myself. And yeah, but how do you it... decide which expansions to get? Like, is it is it all or nothing for you? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, do you think that this is do you think that this is something that you're willing to attribute to an unreasonable completionist urge, or do you think that this is in the case rational of, consumer behavior? In the case of Simon, yes. Okay, it is too much. <laughs> yeah. and, but I'm wondering, like, and then, like I said, there, here's a comparison to Fantasy Flight games. Who do you think does this more egregiously? I feel as though the Fantasy Flight game model is very similar to a sort of Games Workshop, more sustainable type business, where they are, have a constant slow churn of products to come out. They they do this with Imperial Assault. They did this with Descent. It's a slowly. You know, every, you mean, you mean every, Fantasy Flight? Fantasy Flight. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. yes, Fantasy Flight. Back when they were a game publisher. Back when, yeah, <laughs> back before Asmodee did terrible, terrible things to them. It did them um, dirty. Um, and all of their living card games, like, oh my God, is there enough Arkham Horror the card game stuff? Like, that is is tons of stuff, and and the new Marvel Champion stuff. Like, how much of that is there? Sorry, so are you are you defending this or not? No, no, you I'm, went back I'm and forth in the same. Company. I'm saying which one? Yeah, no. What, which one do you think is more egregious? The oh, the, the fancy flight or the Simon? The Simon that does it all at once with this huge bill, or the the fancy flight games that you know slowly trickles it out. Okay, well, here's what I'll say. There's another like we tend to blame crowdfunding, and crowdfunding is absolutely to blame for a lot of this, or to blame is a function of a lot of this and a driver of a lot of this. I tend to easily opt out of completionist urges whenever there's a meta that I have to start worrying about. And that has saved me from a lot of instances. The moment, like, that that's when I stop playing Warhammer Underworlds, right? That's, that's like, oh, clearly this is not some sort of bespoke side project that you're doing because you think it's cool. Oh, now there's a meta that's evolving. And I do not trust companies to manage metas. There's only one company that I've ever seen and this is not I'm, not, I'm not saying I've seen them all try to manage metas, but of the games that I've played, there's only one company that I've seen manage a tournament meta in a non-mercenary way, and that's Corvus Belly with Infinity. When they see an imbalance in the game, they either update freely available stats, they never charge you for any rules, or what they do is the next season for the tournament, they, they, they tweak the mission parameters so as to make less useful units be able to have a chance to shine. They don't do it on the base of here's your new codex that you need to buy, or here's the new season pack that you need to buy, or oh, these cards are banned now, you don't get to use them anymore. Yeah, that, since you brought it up, it was actually, I was thinking about putting in the news, because they've released yet another uh, Warhammer Underworlds main box, right? Yeah. And so I did at least half an hour of searching whether they supported anything, like even sort of like an upgrade pack or anything like that. They put, they themselves, at least that's not easily searchable, have put out nothing. Yeah. You either buy the new stuff and all of your other old stuff is useless. They do have this thing called rivals. So I don't want to, you know, discount everything because I'm not sure 100% how this, these rival decks work. Yeah. From a brief read, it was as though, uh, Everyone just plays with a rival deck and uses none of their faction cards. These rival decks huh. are a replacement. Okay. Like I said, I'll have to look more yeah, into yeah, it, yeah. but that would be a way that you could bring in the new, the older figures because you're just using these totally different decks. I'll look more into it, but still, that is not a, an ideal way. So I didn't, yeah. I, I am 
completely done with Warhammer Underworlds. Yeah, it's a shame. It's such a great, like, nothing yeah. kills for me enthusiasm for a game system other than that sort of mercenary exploitation of a community scene. That's the kind of FOMO, that's the kind of completionism that I find most easy to avoid. And as I say, the, the, for me, the, the, the shining moment was, it was almost like an epiphany. There was like music and a shaft of life descended from the ceiling. Or maybe that was just me falling through the floor. Uh, it was during the last game found campaign for Too Many Bones. It's like, oh, there's more Too Many Bones to be had. I'm like, okay, so this is how many hundreds of dollars for new stuff? I really like Too Many Bones. It's great. Do I need more? <laughs> I don't think I do. I felt like I'd lost 15 pounds. <laughs> and I, I seriously wonder... If, uh, Sent you know, Sentinels of the Multiverse came out again uh, today, well, it did actually, but <laughs> in the third edition. But I seriously wonder if I'd be able to restrain it. Now, obviously, the amount of money that one sinks into a complete set of second edition Sentinels of the Multiverse pales in comparison to stay staying on top of everything with a Chip Theory Games product uh, project. Because I mean, for one thing, prices are higher now, and it's a lot more expensive to begin with. But I wonder. The only other series that I, I have kept up to date with recently, as I said, is Street Masters. But Street Masters has only had two major Kickstarter projects and one kind of side project that has yet to fulfill and maybe never will. But so, it gets to the table regularly, right? Yes. So I would feel no guilt about that whatsoever. That's just it. Like, again, it's one of those best-in-class or nearly best-in-class games that I would bling out if I could. There's no need to. And uh, will definitely stay in my collection on the reg. It's those other games that are good, maybe even great sometimes, but not necessarily best in class and not the one that you keep going back to. Those are the ones where I feel like, you know, always those are the ones where I now feel comfortable saying enough is enough. I've got enough and, and, and I can move on, which is weird because I remember the first time I collected HeroScape. Heroescape came out. Uh, Heroescape as a model had all these waves, and each wave would consist of like five blister packs or a, or a single large box. When I first collected Heroescape, I think it's because I was too poor. I didn't get everything. I only got the things that I wanted. So, for example, uh, an easy group of units to avoid were the samurai. Everybody who plays Heroescape knows that there's only one group of samurai that's worth their cost, and this is the samurai that comes in the base game. And all the other ones are overcosted and not really worth it. So I didn't definitely didn't have any of those. But I was also able to get multiples of the ones I really wanted. Like I had, I, I had two of the the British uh, uh, Fusiliers. I had uh, two or three of, of of the Goblin Archers. Now, because I bought secondhand a locals collection of Heroescape, now I have one of everything, which I feel is simultaneously too much and too little, <laughs> <laughs> and even more of the ones you already had lots of. No, no, those I sold. I, oh, gotcha. I sold oh, my first. Act, oh, you actually sold Heroescape stuff. Yeah, th this was when I moved from the United States. This is a long time ago. This is when I went from endless storage to zero storage. And I had to get rid of it. So I made I made a lot of money off that sale, let me tell you. But yeah, it's weird. Poverty will cure me of completionism. It's true. Lack of storage space cures me of completionism. Only now that I'm in a position where, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not rich, but I can get, I can be completionist for, for the, the games that I like. And I have enough storage for the games I like, but I, I seem to be a little bit cured. Maybe it's this job. Could be. It could be this job. Walker. There's these, some side or one side thing I'm, I want to talk about. Sure. And that's the, like sort of visual things, like these bookshelf series games. Yeah. You know, oh, where like, oh. Where they're like numbered and all the backs are the Cat same. Catnip, Walker. And, and they, Catnip. And they fit in your shelf just right. Uh, yes. And when you look at them, it, it, you know, they're yes. all numbered and they're all the same color. I and... had so much weakness for that. I went through a period, absolutely, yes, 100%. Those people who have like all the Alia games numbered in order or the, one, the ones for whom Queen numbers their Steffenfeld Deluxe City collections, right? Yes. It's like, ooh, this is number six. That means you got to get one through five, right? Yeah, it's it's so such catnip. I had zero. Zero. I went through a brief phase where I cared about that, where I specifically, it was Avalon Hill Games, and I got them through trade. I didn't buy them because they were all long out of print anyway. And then I got over that right quick, and now I just have the three Avalon Hill Games that I keep, namely Upfront, Merchant of Venus, and Civilization. And, oh, uh, sorry, Civilization, I, I still have the, the Avalon Hill version, but in my head I have uh, so many other versions. I Sorry, I meant to say Gunslinger, the Richard Hamblum experiences. I also have, you know, Magic Realm, but it's not the same size, so it doesn't it doesn't fit. Yeah, yeah, utter, complete catnip. 
Alia knew what they were doing when they numbered their series. Queen knew what they were doing. Avalon Hill knew what they were doing. Yeah. I haven't. I'm now in a position where my game, I don't display any games at all. Zero. They're all just in a basement in a dark, not visually pleasant environment. So I feel no impulse to have a pretty, pretty row of the ball on a line. I think I hit all my points. Just a little quick one on expansions, because expansions have been the same since the dawn of time. Where are you? The dawn of time? Yes, since the were, dawn of time. Were there expansions expansion. to the game of Ur? Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> that all the booster pack? <laughs> and you need you need to buy them immediately, right? Because so that special powers deck? Yes. Okay, sorry. So they're stop always, because they're again. always very hard to get. It didn't used to be that way. Expansions so? used to stay in print. Things used to stay in print. Expansions less so, but yes. they used to be available in print certainly more than two hot seconds after they got published. I mean, actually, one thing to note, I think, as a, as a, as a closing note, we used to be in a, in a position where you had to, you had to get that la- the, every last expansion of Imperial Assault or you'd have FOMO. Now, every single game is published under a FOMO model because it's going to go out of stock in five seconds and then you have to wait for their crowdfunding and then you might get it two years later. And then lastly, when there's tons of expansions and add-ons, but you just end up playing the base game because that's the best way to play it. Yes. Now, I only have one example. I'm sure you have more. Mine is Innovation, where yep. Innovation has a lot of expansions. Yep. I, don't, I don't play it a lot, so I'm really not one to talk. But from the many people that have said it, Absolutely. they just play the base game and that they say that is the best way to play it. Yep. That's I am looking... <laughs> That's why I'm looking forward for the new comprehensive set. It's going to try to make the expansions more integrated. Oh no, I'm less I'm less cured than I thought. <laughs> How many expansions of Cosmic Encounter do people need? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I may resemble that remark. <laughs> well, here's the thing: given that there are precisely zero groups of individuals I could find in Kingston that will play Cosmic Encounter with me. If they released a new expansion for Cosmic Encounter, I would not get it. So I've been cured of that environmentally. Call it call it there, shock treatment. There you go. <laughs> oh, but I do resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. We appreciate your having decided to spend some time with us. You can find all our contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. It's a great website. I recommend you check it out. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thank you again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bicken. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>